Everyone, thank you so much for joining today. Welcome to um, this week's Cockroach Labs webinar. We're going to be talking about how two fintech giants migrated from Oracle to Cockroach DB. Um, but before we get started, I'm just going to share the video so we can introduce ourselves. Um, so I'm going to start that up. Okay. Yes. Um, my name is Megan Goldman. I'm a product marketer here at Cockroach Labs, and I'm here with two of our awesome product managers, uh, Roland and Piyush. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Piyush Singh. I'm a product manager here at Cockroach. Uh, I specifically focus on our observability tooling, so really understanding how to monitor your database and like troubleshoot the performance of your slow queries. And I'm Roland Crosby. I'm also a product manager here at Cockroach. I work on bulk IO and security, so getting data in and out of your database, and then making sure that all your operations run in a secure fashion. Cool. Um, and that's us. You can see our nice photos. Um, and yeah, just before we start, I just wanted to go over a few different housekeeping items. So please ask us questions throughout this webinar. Um, there's a little question button at the bottom of the screen. It's, it's called Q&A. And we'll have two spots to answer questions. One partway through the webinar and one at the end. So definitely put any thoughts and questions in there. And um, at the end of the webinar, we're going to send out a survey. So the survey is really valuable for us. We've gotten a lot of really great feedback over the years that's helped us improve the way we do our webinars. So please um, fill that out when you get it. And then finally, we'll be sending over a recording of the whole webinar after the event so you can rewatch it and um, get, get uh, another viewing of that. So now um, we'll get started. I'll hide our faces. You don't need to see that while we're talking. Um, all right. So um, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar is about um, two large financial, uh, financial services companies that migrated to Cockroach DB. But before we get into those two case studies, which Roland and Piyush will be presenting, I wanted to just give a brief overview of Cockroach DB in general, um, the, what kind of database it is, how it fits into the database landscape, to give everyone a really good sense of um, the background um, to, put, to help put the case studies in context. So Cockroach DB is a distributed SQL database. And what does that mean? Why is it important? Um, so basically about five to 10 years ago, when uh, companies were really starting to uh, migrate to the cloud um, and break down applications from monolithic to microservices, there was a lot of frustration that arose with databases. Uh, there was some frustration with traditional relational databases because as everyone knows, it's really difficult to scale them. Um, you have to either get a bigger machine or try to do a lot of like manual sharding, which is really painstaking and, and difficult and time consuming. Um, at the same time, there was some frustration with NoSQL databases, which you know, they're really built for the cloud and for scaling, but you don't really want to trust your um, transactional workloads with a NoSQL database. You don't want to trust a workload that needs like a very high level of consistency with that kind of database. Um, so people were like, decided that they needed a solution to this. And the ideal solution would be a database that would be able to scale really easily and be very flexible while also maintaining um, consistency and reliability of a traditional relational database. So um, some folks at Google came out with the Spanner paper about this. Um, and one of the initial database, uh, uh, distributed SQL databases was Google Spanner, um, which is pretty cool. And since then, the field has expanded to you know, include other distributed SQL databases like CockroachDB. So um, what are the kind of the key characteristics that define a distributed SQL database? So we really like to think about it in five key characteristics. The first one is the database obviously has to speak SQL. I mean, it's called distributed SQL. It's built for um, structured data. It should speak a very uh, familiar uh, type of SQL. Um, the second one is that the database should scale very easily and should ease the operational complexity of scaling. So as everyone knows, like cloud operations are difficult and complex. The database is supposed to be, um, you know, make that process a little bit easier. Um, the third characteristic is a distributed SQL database should be always on and resilient. And typically the way this is achieved is by replicating data um, in a, a 
in a geo-replicated way. So basically having multiple copies of data spread out um, over a geographic area um, so that if you know a single data center or availability zone goes down, the database is able to remain on. Um, another important characteristic is ACID compliance. So this is a transactional database. Um, so consistency is very important as opposed to those NoSQL solutions where consistency isn't as important. And finally, um, the, a distributed SQL database should be able to tie data to a location. Um, and this is really important to reduce latency in a distributed setting and also for some compliance reasons. So with GDPR, um, if you have a distributed database where you know, part of it's living in the US, part of it's living in Europe, it's really important to be able to make sure that European data remains in Europe. All right, so now how does CockroachDB fit into this whole landscape? Um, CockroachDB was uh, really architected from the ground up to be a distributed SQL database. So it was, um, it was it's not built on top of any existing database. It was, it was built from the ground up, um, which means that it, it you know, fits the model very well and it was really built for the cloud as well. Um, in addition, CockroachDB is Postgres wire compatible. So that's the, the language of SQL that CockroachDB fits or speaks. So it really fits in with existing applications and is, is pretty easy for developers to um, communicate with it. Um, in terms of scaling, CockroachDB scales automatically. So um, you know, there's no additional burden there. There's no manual sharding. It just handles up all by itself. And um, CockroachDB is always on, so data is replicated at least three times. And um, this allows the, uh, the database to remain on in the event of some kind of failure. And then when it, when it comes to the, uh, the asset compliance with the consistency, CockroachDB actually uses a consensus algorithm called Raft, which is a variation of Paxos, if anyone's familiar with Paxos. Um, and this allows it to guarantee the highest level of isolation, which is serializable isolation, which is pretty cool. Um, and then finally, every node is a read-write gateway, which is also a pretty unique feature. Um, and it means that every single node has access to all of the data in the whole database, um, which is kind of like, uh, I guess it reduces latency. So it's like, if you have someone who's, or you have data, a data request that's coming in um, near a node, um, it, can, it can read or write from that node and doesn't have to travel to a distant node to, to um, write. And then the last characteristic, which is uh, very important as well, is that you're able to pin data to a specific location in CockroachDB. Um, and as I was mentioning earlier, this lets you, um, less latencies become lower and reduced, and then also um, allows the database to comply with, GD with GDPR. So now that you guys have a little bit of background on CockroachDB and distributed SQL. Um, I'm gonna shortly pass it off to Roland and Piyush to go over the two customer stories. And um, just some background here. So these are two large financial service companies based in the US who have both migrated off of Oracle to CockroachDB. Um, and in both cases, the apps they migrated are identity access and management systems, which are a really good fit for CockroachDB for reasons that um, Roland and Piyush will get into in a moment. So I will pass it off to Piyush for the first case study. Okay, uh, thanks Megan. I'm um, just gonna go ahead and apologize in advance. I'm recovering from a slight cold. So if you hear any sniffles and coughs, that's just uh, me still getting over this, this cold. So uh, apologies for that. <clears throat> but let's go ahead and get started. So, um, this financial software company. Um, so just a little bit of background on the company itself. Um, so this is a consumer financial uh, software company. Um, they are headquartered in the US. Uh, they have several thousand employees, do a few billion in revenue every year. Um, and they've been slowly growing through uh, customer acquisitions, uh, sorry, um, acquisitions of other companies in their space uh, over the uh, past few years. So, um, you know, they originally offered one product, found several complementary products um, in their space, and then acquired the companies that offered those services. So um, as Megan mentioned, uh, you know, the company was trying to 
essentially centralize the identity and access management layer for um, all of these various services. So um, because they had grown through acquisitions, actually, uh, each of these different services had their you know, users require a, a different login, right? Um, so you can imagine, you know, if they have some personal finance software, um, and then let's say, um, you know, maybe some uh, business accounting software or even like tax software or something like that, um, each of these different services would essentially require the user to have a different username and password. Um, so they wanted to centralize that for a few reasons. One, um, obviously, they want to tie, um, you know, this concept of identity um, to all the different services they offer. They just want to have users remember one single username and password. Uh, and then obviously, it's, it's better for them as well, because they can associate all the data with these disparate accounts to um, like a single identity. Uh, and then beyond that, obviously, if they centralize the service, um, they only have to worry about one service, keeping it up and maintaining it, uh, instead of dealing with, you know, like three, four, five different services um, that they have to maintain. So um, how are they actually doing this in the past? So um, after they had acquired these, these different companies, uh, they actually deployed a solution using Oracle. So um, they had two data centers that they were, that they were running uh, across essentially two different regions. And they were using Oracle with Golden Gate um, to uh, create sort of this active passive setup where all the writes were coming into a single region and then reads were happening um, in the, in the uh, data center that was closest to the user. Um, so what were some of the issues with this particular setup? So when a user would actually uh, create an account, um, they would you know, uh, essentially connect to um, the one region that was accepting all of the rights. Um, you know, they would create an account. So essentially a record would be inserted into the database that was um, managing their identity and access management layer. Um, so essentially saying, hey, like here's the, the username and so hash copy of the password. Uh, and then that data was actually replicated um, to the other data center. The problem was um, there was actually quite a large amount of replication lag. So um, it could take anywhere between 15 seconds and up to five minutes for that data to be copied from the first data center to the other. Um, and what that meant, because, you know, writes were going into only one region and reads were happening, uh, you know, as close to the user as possible, um, you could end up in this scenario where as a user of this, uh, you know, this company's software, you create an account and then you're unable to log into the account you just created for up to five minutes. Uh, obviously, that's, that's not a great user experience. So this is something that they definitely wanted to, to deal with. Um, beyond that, they also had an issue when they were thinking about scaling. So um, they wanted to create you know, a European data center um, so that they could keep all of their European users' data in Europe um, and also just improve uh, the speed of their services for their European users. So you know, if you're in Europe, it shouldn't take you any longer to log in than someone who's in the US. Um, however, because they were using Oracle with Golden Gate, it was actually pretty, pretty uh, complex to expand their existing setup um, into uh, a new region. And beyond that, it was also an active passive setup. So um, they still would probably be restricted to accepting rights in just a single, uh, a single region, which wouldn't work um, for compliance reasons. And then uh, lastly, um, they were also worried about uh, potential data loss. So because they had this kind of active passive setup, um, with quite a quite a large amount of replication lag in the event that um, the data center uh, that they were running that was accepting all the writes went down, um, they might actually lose some of the data that hadn't been replicated across to that that second failover copy of, uh, of their database. Um, so these are kind of some of the problems that they were thinking about, um, you know, coming into this evaluation that they did with Cockroach. Um, so keeping these problems in mind, some of the requirements that they had for a, a replacement solution um, were, you know, immediate replication. So they didn't want to have this weird, awkward um, uh, 15 second to five minute gap in, uh, in replication. Um, they wanted to do, with, do away with that entirely. Um, they wanted to simplify scaling. So they wanted to make sure that you know, if in the event that they uh, expanded into Europe, which was something that they were planning to do, um, that it would be simple operationally. Um, you know, there wouldn't be all this complexity of setting up Golden Gate and essentially doing change data capture uh, between these these different data centers, and then also 
um, you know, dealing with rights coming into only a single region. They just didn't want to have to deal with all that, that um, operational complexity. So they wanted something that, that scaled very simply. Um, third, they wanted, <clears throat> excuse me, they wanted to keep the service uh, extremely highly available, right? So um, because this service is dealing with their users and how they log into their, their platform of uh, services, um, they didn't want, you know, the service to ever go down because that would mean essentially users couldn't log into any of their, um, you know, like personal finance software. Uh, and that would just be a, a terrible user experience. They wanted to keep this up uh, at all costs. And then lastly, they actually had some um, performance requirements. So, um, you know, coming back to their use case, uh, you can think of writes and reads as roughly corresponding to uh, account creation and then logging in, right? So. Um, when you create an account, you're actually going to insert a record into you know, the table that holds all of your, your users and their, their hash passwords. Uh, but that only happens once, right? It only happens when you actually create an account um, with this company. Uh, the extremely common case is that you're logging in with an account that already exists. Um, so for the lifetime of, of any given user, they're only creating an account once and then they're logging in multiple times. So they're only doing one write and then many, many reads over, over their lifetime, right? So for that reason, this company was actually really willing to trade off um, write performance for extremely quick read performance. So the requirement was roughly half a second for writes uh, versus they wanted essentially single digit millisecond uh, performance for their reads. <coughs> Excuse me. So how does CockroachDB actually uh, meet these requirements and solve these problems for them? So CockroachDB always offers um, immediate, or in other words, synchronous replication. So um, you can create a CockroachDB cluster that spans, let's say, multiple AWS regions. Um, and whenever you connect to any node, so as Megan mentioned, um, all the nodes are symmetric. You can do reads and writes when you connect to any node in your cluster. Um, so when you connect to any node, um, actually, when you write data, Cockroach ensures that that data is replicated um, you know, up to three times by default. Uh, before that write is actually acknowledged back to the client. So um, what this actually means is by the time you receive an acknowledgement for a write, that write is extremely durable because it's already been committed in uh, a quorum of um, pl the, the places that you require for your write. So if you have a replication factor of three, let's say, that means that you know, your data is going to be written three times inside of Cockroach, um, you'll only get acknowledgement for your write once that data has been replicated at least twice. Um, so, you know, by doing this, Cockroach is essentially guaranteeing that your data will be extremely highly available um, and also that you're not dealing with any kind of weird asynchronous uh, replication lag. Um, and what this means for uh, the company that we're talking about is essentially that their users will no longer have this uh, weird experience where they create an account and then suddenly they can't log in to that account they just created for, you know, let's say five minutes. Um, once they create the account, they'll be able to access it immediately. Um, beyond that, Cockroach also simplifies scaling. So um, there are two kinds of scaling. So obviously, scaling the number of writes and reads that can happen in your cluster uh, is very straightforward. All you need to do is spin up additional nodes in any of the given regions that you're already deployed, point them to the existing nodes in your cluster, and you're pretty much set, uh, ready to go. Um, and then it also simplifies something like expanding into Europe. So all you have to do is add additional nodes uh, in, a, in a data center in Europe, um, and then again, point those nodes to the existing uh, nodes in your cluster. You do have to perform some uh, additional configuration um, using tools that we've created to uh, domicile data, for example. Um, so using what we call zone configurations. Um, and that allows you to do things like pinning uh, data into a specific region, um, and it enables what we call specific topology patterns um, that you can use to essentially optimize the performance of your uh, instance of Cockroach, uh, CockroachDB. I'll get into exactly how um, this company set up their cluster in just a second so we can see um, what would actually be involved in expanding into a new region. Um, and obviously, they want to keep the service extremely highly available. So. Um, with the, the transition to CockroachDB, this company was essentially saying, hey, uh, at the same time, we can also just go ahead and expand into the EU. 
Um, and with a three region deployment, actually, um, that means Cockroach can survive uh, a failure of an entire AWS region if they're deployed you know, via AWS. So uh, because they have uh, three different um, regions that they're deployed across, Cockroach will actually automatically try to spread the um, rep replicas of your data. So you know, by default, we're replicating it three times. It'll actually try to spread those replicas into um, the configuration that will give you the best survivability guarantees. So if you tell Cockroach, hey, I'm deployed in you know, US West, US East, EU West, um, Cockroach will say, okay, that's great. I'm gonna stick one copy of this data that you're, you're inserting into your database in each of those regions so that if one of them goes down, you'll still have a quorum of replicas that you can still you know, read and write from. Um, and beyond that, if you do actually see like a, a failure of an individual machine, Cockroach actually handles that automatically. So um, when a machine goes down, Cockroach knows what data was living on that machine and it moves it around, it up replicates any data that was lost because of that failure, and it moves it around in your cluster so that um, you, it basically recovers itself automatically. And then lastly, <coughs> in order to meet their uh, performance um, needs, we actually recommended uh, what we call a specific topology pattern. Um, so using the pattern that we recommended to them, they were actually able to hit their, their performance needs. So, um, in their particular setup, they saw that writes were taking just under 300 milliseconds and reads were actually taking on the order of one millisecond. Um, now, of course, the thing to keep in mind here is we're measuring these latencies on the database side. So this doesn't include any of the, the latency between the client and the database. Um, so you would have to factor that in if you were taking a measurement on the client side. Um, but these, these performance uh, measurements are actually great, right? They're, they're extremely fast, um, reads are only taking one millisecond, and it meets the requirements that they had for, uh, for their new database. Now, how do we actually um, help them achieve this level of performance? Well, um, as I mentioned, we kind of have these things we call topology patterns in CockroachDB. Um, and what these are are essentially configurations of your schema and the actual physical hardware in your cluster um, that we recommend in order to achieve a certain kind of performance. Um, so in this particular case, we recommended something that we refer to as duplicate indexes. Um, and the reason we recommended that was to essentially really give them extremely snappy read performance um, perhaps at, at the slight expense of write performance. But you can see here, um, we did manage to meet their, their write performance requirements as well. Now, what does, uh, what does the duplicate indexes topology pattern actually look like? Um, so here is a little diagram that has an example of, uh, of this specific topology pattern. Um, so you can see here, this is a hypothetical cluster that's deployed in three, three regions in the US. Um, so we have uh, three nodes in US West, three nodes in US Central, and three nodes in US East. Uh, the nodes are represented by the little green cylinders. Now, um, you know, you have clients in each of these re regions, which would essentially be your users. Um, and then, you know, through your application, they will actually interact with the da uh, database through a load balancer. So they'll be connecting to any one of the nodes in this, in this particular region. So what the duplicate indexes uh, topology pattern actually recommends is um, you take uh, your you know, base table, and you can see here the base table is represented um, by the color orange. And you can see there is um, you know, a little orange slice in each of the three regions. Um, and I guess in order to explain this specific pattern, we need to discuss the concept of leaseholders. Um, so in, Co in CockroachDB, um, Cockroach automatically splits your data up into these things we call ranges. Um, and each range is essentially uh, replicated three times to kind of guarantee survivability of your data. And then these, these replicas are spread, you know, throughout your entire cluster. Um, and generally they're made uh, as diverse as possible to you know, guarantee survivability as, we, as we've been talking about. However, um, for each set of three replicas, um, so for each range of your data, we actually designate one of those replicas as a leaseholder. Um, and the leaseholder is responsible for coordinating all of the reads and writes to that specific range of data. 
Um, so in this diagram, you can kind of imagine, you know, this, this table that we're thinking about, um, let's pretend it only has one range and therefore three replicas. So you can see, <coughs> excuse me, the leaseholder for this table is in US Central. And that means that all of the reads and writes that happen on this table would, will need to be coordinated by that node in US Central. Now, we know that, you know, if you're in US West, uh, you don't want to have to go talk to the machines that are in US Central in order to read your data out because um, this company had a, a very strict uh, upper bound on read performance. Well, what we can do to solve that is essentially create additional indexes um, on this table and have those indexes store the relevant columns from that table uh, along with the index. And then we can actually um, pin the leaseholders for the indexes uh, in the regions where um, the original table didn't have a leaseholder. So you can actually see um, we create two additional indexes here that store any relevant columns that we would need to look up. Um, and there is a leaseholder in each region. Um, so you can see US West has the leaseholder on index two. US East has the leaseholder on index one. And what this means is each region now has a leaseholder and therefore can serve, um, you know, reads and writes extremely quickly, uh, or rather reads only, uh, extremely quickly in that specific region. Um, so we call this, you know, duplicate indexes because essentially you're creating multiple indexes so that you can pin a leaseholder in each region. Um, and this specific pattern is recommended when you want extremely fast read performance. Um, and you're okay with trading off uh, write performance and having slightly slower write performance to achieve that. Um, so just in a, a brief conclusion, um, you know, this company set out to uh, replace their existing Oracle setup. Um, and the reasons that they wanted to replace it were, you know, this awkward replication lag where their users were, you know, creating accounts and weren't able to access them, um, you know, due to the complexity of expanding into a new region that they wanted to expand into uh, in Europe. Um, and obviously for high availability and, and uh, preventing data loss and CockroachDB was able to achieve all of those things for them. Perfect. Thank you, Piyush. Um, that was awesome. So we actually had some questions come in during the presentation that we're going to talk about now. Um, so if you, if anyone has any more questions, definitely feel free to enter them. Um, so one of the questions we had that came in yeah. um, was here, let me read it out. So why, so why is there frustration with NoSQL databases? So this is going back to what I was talking about in the beginning mm -hmm. um, about frustration with NoSQL and also with traditional databases. So do you want to, um, give that one a stab? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we actually talk about this internally quite a bit. So, um, you know, the, the reason that a lot of companies were driven to use NoSQL databases in, you know, the late 2000s, the early 2010s, uh, was essentially for this, this need for scaling, right? Um, so as companies uh, started having millions to billions of people using their applications every day, um, you know, traditional relational databases that lived on a single machine um, couldn't be easily partitioned uh, to, you know, live across multiple machines, right? So people turned to these NoSQL databases, um, and those databases were much easier to scale uh, across multiple machines, hor scaling horizontally. However, in order to do that, they actually gave up quite a few consistency guarantees. So the issue with these NoSQL databases is it actually becomes really hard to reason about correctness in your application. Um, and a perfect example of this is actually a paper um, called Acid Rain. Uh, and it was written by Peter Bayliss, and I believe there's another author as well who's escaping me right now. Um, but this acid rain paper actually talks about this in the context of uh, e-commerce e -commerce sites. Um, and they're actually able to show that um, in, in databases with weak isolation guarantees, so uh, you know, isolation guarantees that are below serializable, um, you're actually able to uh, perform operations that are essentially the digital equivalent of shoplifting. So um, they're able to show that there are lots of anomalies that you can use uh, in attacks um, to essentially get items for free from, from online stores. So you're actually able to, you know, um, if you click the checkout button in your shopping cart and go to a different tab and add a bunch of items into the cart while you're in the checkout process, um, you can actually get a lot of those items for free if your database doesn't have very good isolation guarantees. 
Um, so this is exactly the frustration that people have with NoSQL. It's, it's extremely hard to reason about the consistency and correctness of that NoSQL database. Um, so that's just a, a little bit of background on kind of how we think about this stuff uh, internally here at Cockroach. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, yeah, we had someone else ask specifically about um, this, uh, the strengths and weaknesses of Cockroach DB for this type of workload versus Cassandra or Scylla DB, but it's pretty, I think, um, I think Fuge kind of addressed that in his NoSQL um, answer. Do anything else you want to add there? Yeah, I think while uh, Cassandra does offer a somewhat better query language than you might see from some of the uh, NoSQL databases, it still uh, doesn't offer the exact same uh, strong consistency guarantees you would expect. Uh, as well as support for things like uh, foreign keys and transactions involving uh, ranges all over the database and that sort of thing. So um, you just you really you want a real SQL system in these kinds of cases uh, that provides good uh, transactional guarantees. And that's what you get from Cockroach DB. Okay, thank you, Roland. Um, and we'll have some more time for questions at the end of the webinar. So definitely um, enter some more questions we have. And now I'm going to pass it off to Roland to talk about the next customer. Great, thank you. So this is a somewhat similar case study as far as uh, the industry and the specific application that they decided to migrate first. But aside from that, it's, uh, it, it's pretty different as far as the characteristics of the applications that are being migrated themselves, as well as the topology that this is all running in. So uh, the background on this customer is it's a global uh, financial data products company. Uh, they have also grown through a series of acquisitions over the years. Um, they typically run business to business transactions. They don't really have as much of a consumer business. It's more uh, doing data analysis uh, across a wide variety of verticals, some of which have, were acquired uh, via these independent acquisitions, uh, some of which were um, developed in house. So the applications are relatively independent running in physical data centers around the world. Uh, so US as well as uh, additional continents as well. Uh, primarily, the OLTP transactional databases that were in use were Oracle, uh, inherited from those acquired companies, so sort of uh, all over the place, a, a whole bunch of different databases, but primarily Oracle. Most of the applications uh, were written in Java, so at least that's relatively standardized and using Hibernate for a persistence layer, uh, so that led to a relatively straightforward transition in that regard. The company's goal was to enable a global hybrid cloud migration. So the data centers that they were running in were uh, typically these legacy physical data centers uh, spread across the US and uh, multiple continents. Uh, the goal is not to shut them all down at once. That seemed like a, too big of an ask uh, to do at once. Uh, and they wanted to make sure that they could keep this hybrid cloud deployment topology with uh, both some physical data centers as well as a gradual migration to uh, cloud platform. The existing architecture pattern of the applications that they were running sort of lent itself nicely to this pattern. It's a, you might call it these days a microservices pattern or service oriented architecture where you have a bunch of independent, relatively small, uh, well scoped services that have their own data needs. So that made it a little bit simpler to consolidate the database workloads and move everything to a single, uh, single topology. And they decided to begin the cloud migration with their internal platform services. So authentication and access management. And then once the platform services were in place, uh, they decided to migrate the remainder of their applications uh, to that platform. So what were the requirements uh, for this new database? Well, they needed to be able to deploy in that hybrid cloud environment. They needed strong enterprise grade security because they're dealing with some sensitive data in a lot of cases and they needed a strong performance in a distributed setting. And I'll get a little bit into the specifics of their performance requirements in a bit because those, uh, they had a different set of requirements than we uh, saw with the other case study. But still, uh, Cockroach DB is flexible enough to be able to meet both of those. So for the hybrid cloud deployment, uh, the company evaluated the proprietary database offerings from the cloud vendors, specifically Google Spanner, but since, it, uh, since it's tied very strongly to not just Google Cloud, but specific Google Cloud regions and topologies, it wasn't flexible enough to meet the needs of having both the on-premises and uh, distributed hybrid cloud deployment. 
they looked at expanding their existing Oracle deployments using a hybrid cloud uh, system using Golden Gate or other things to connect multiple Oracle databases together. But as Piyush described in his case study, uh, some of these, some, some of the work to do that was a bit too fragile and complex to rely on as their eventual end goal solution. It might have worked if they didn't anticipate doing a, a full eventual migration or didn't anticipate change in the topology of the data centers and cloud regions that they're running in, but it's just, it, it's too much additional operational overhead as well as just cost uh, to run that and to uh, keep that up and running, especially with multi-master type of topologies. In contrast to both of those options, CockroachDB natively deploys to any cloud, both either public or private, as well as hybrid cloud environments. So uh, we, we work both in hybrid multi-cloud deployments or in single cloud and on-premises data centers. The only, the only real requirements that uh, are absolutely fixed for CockroachDB are that the nodes are able to talk to each other and that you have some kind of clock synchronization, which is, people are sometimes worried about that, but it's actually a relatively easy problem to solve uh, these days with uh, reliable clocks. The second major uh, requirement that this company had was enterprise grade security. So uh, they're handling financial data. Uh, they needed to make sure that uh, that wasn't at risk and that uh, we had strong protections in place on that. So uh, encryption of rest was really the, the killer cockroach DB feature as far as security went. Uh, we do encrypt all data in transit already uh, via TLS uh, using X509 certificates. But in addition to that, they also needed the data when it's sitting on the on the node's disks to be encrypted as well. And so that's an enterprise feature that uh, we launched earlier this year uh, and they were able to go into production with that without any issues. Finally, they needed a good geo distribution story. So as I mentioned before, they're running across multiple continents uh, with both the on-premises and cloud data centers. Um, and their applications are also spread across those locations and having to traverse oceans to get to authenticate your application uh, is not, a, not, not an attractive prospect. Fortunately, CockroachDB supports these multi-region clusters and allows you to do real level partitioning, which allows you to, in this case, and I'll get into the topology in a minute, pin the data to data centers close to where the clients are. Regardless of any partitioning that's set up, uh, it all remains standard SQL with a few minor extensions. So from the user's perspective, uh, they don't even need to know, uh, the, the application doesn't even need to know that the data is partitioned. The interface remains the same uh, and the queries remain the same. So what does the topology look like? Well, one of the attributes of these applications here is that the applications are actually, the locality is known. Uh, in fact, the, the applications accessing the identity and access management platform run in the same data centers as the access data itself. So they wanted to make sure that reads and writes for this particular application uh, to the identity and access management platform were both very fast. CockroachDB has a topology pattern for deployment that matches this very well. It's called geopartitioned replicas. In that case, you pin all of the replicas of the data, so three by default, to the same data center where the application is accessing it. And that works nicely because they knew deterministically where the applications were going to be sitting running from uh, so that they could talk to that. It's a little bit different from the, the scenario that Piyush was talking about where you have users running all over the world where you can't predict where the application is going to be accessed from. In that case, it made sense to partition the, the consumer authentication data and uh, replicate the indexes around the world. But for this, because they weren't uh, strongly tied to specific data centers, it was easy to predict what the access patterns were going to be and reduce the latency for those in-region reads and writes. Now, if an application is accessing the database from outside that region, the data is still accessible. There's not a, there's not a problem uh, getting to it. There's just increased latency in that case, um, optimized for the common case where the application is in fact in the same region as, the, as its data store. And this is all specific to the IAM application. So for other applications or even other tables in the same database, 
the localities and the partitioning could be set up in a completely different pattern if necessary. Uh, this was just what happened to make sense for this particular platform application. So after making that deployment, um, they plan to deploy additional authorization and entitlement service on top of CockroachDB. Uh, Cockroach Labs is working with this company to provide training for the application developers to simplify migration of additional services once the platform uh, is in place. And uh, this is all working towards the eventual goal of enabling the company to shut down certain specific on-premises data centers uh, and migrate to the hybrid cloud future that they're looking forward to. Perfect. Thank you, Roland. Um, that was good. Um, so we, um, before we get to the Q&A for the end, I just wanted to mention that we have a few more resources on our website in case you guys want to learn some more about some of the things that um, that Roland and Peter were talking about. So in particular, we have this migration guide from Oracle to CockroachDB, um, which we actually recently published and it's very helpful. So the link is right there. And then we also have um, a docs page on our topology patterns. So we have really good docs resources. The, the team is excellent and they put a lot of work into the information there. So um, this is all about the different configuration patterns that Roland and Piyush were talking about. So basically how clusters can be optimized for performance. Um, and now we'll get into some of the Q&A, some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, so the first question we can address is, how do you manage the lag associated with synchronous replication? Um, I can do take you want that. to take that, Roland? Yeah. Sure. So part of, part of what makes Cockroach to be so tunable for this replication scenario is you can decide um, where you want data to be replicated to. In other words, you can, you can pin either the primary or the replicas of a piece of data to specific data centers. And so CockroachDB can return a write to the client, can, can confirm that a write happened successfully as soon as the data gets replicated to, it gets written to a majority of the replicas of the data. And so one pattern that is very common for that, for example, there's various trade-offs that you can do here, but what, one pattern that's common is having two replica, having the data replicated three times, uh, having the primary data in one data center that's close to where the client is, having one replica of it also in that data center, and then having the cluster automatically position uh, the third one somewhere else for diversity. What that means is that you can have uh, both replicas uh, written very quickly and returned to the client immediately, uh, and so you'll be resilient to failure of any node. And then the third replica gets written asynchronously uh, or gets written after the initial response has been sent to the client, uh, so it's guaranteed to uh, be resilient to even data center failure in that case. So if you're interested in learning more about the various trade-offs involved in uh, how to reduce latency on writes, uh, you should check out our topology pattern section on the website. It's linked in the in the webinar and we'll have it sent out afterwards as well. Thank you. Um, another question we had was, um, how does Cockroach DB manage per location um, data replication? So for instance, when, when certain data needs to live in the US versus the EU? Yeah, and that's actually very similar to the, the, the previous answer that, that Roland gave. So, <clears throat> we have this concept of zone configurations. Um, and zone configurations are essentially our way of specifying um, the properties of how data is replicated and where it should be replicated to. Um, so typically what we recommend is you actually specify what we call locality flags for the nodes in your cluster um, on startup. And these locality flags essentially contain uh, a hierarchical definition of where those nodes are located, right? So you can imagine um, I might, and it's just, it's, it's a list of key value pairs. So I, you can imagine I could define a, a region key and um, the values for different nodes would be the different AWS regions that those nodes are in. Um, I could get more specific, go to the availability zone level, even to a specific rack, even in a data center or 
um, like extremely specific location data. Um, so once we have these key value pairs that define the location for all the nodes in, in your cluster, um, you can target data to any level of that hierarchy. So I could say, hey, um, and you can, you can target pretty much an arbitrary level of your schema to uh, a specific location as well. So I could say, I want this entire database or this specific table, this specific index, or even this partition of a table or a partition of an index. Um, I can specify exactly um, what level of my you know, location hierarchy I want to target that data to. So I can say, I want you know, this partition to live in this region, or maybe even more specifically, I could say, I want this specific partition to live on you know, a specific rack in a data center or uh, in a specific availability zone. So Cockroach actually makes this extremely flexible. So you can define your own locality hierarchy. It's, a, it's an arbitrary set of key value pairs, so you can define your own. Uh, and then for pretty much any level of your schema, however you've designed your schema, you can say, I want this data to live in a specific location. Um, beyond that, you can actually say, um, you know, uh, you can define per replica constraints as well. So you could say, um, hey, you know, for each of these three copies of this data, I want, you know, like Roland mentioned, two copies to live in one uh, data center and one copy to live somewhere else or in a different region. Um, so you can kind of mix and match, um, you know, these, uh, these different constraints based on what type of performance and what type of survivability guarantees you're looking to get out of Cockroach. Perfect, thank you, Piyush. Um, so for the additional remaining questions, we'll be emailing out answers to those um, after the fact. And um, I wanted to give a brief description of a conference that Cockroach Labs is actually holding um, in a few weeks here in New York City. So if you're in the US, I know we have some international viewers, but if you're in the US, um, we are holding a conference that is basically a free and open place to discuss multi-cloud initiatives. Um, so what it means to um, architect multi-cloud from a technological perspective or technical perspective versus, um, you know, the administrative, administrative concerns around it. Um, so there's a lot of really great talks and speakers we have at this conference. Um, so definitely um, check out the website and it's escapeconference.io. And for viewing this webinar, we, we'd like to offer you a 40% off code, um, webinar 40. So 40% off your tickets. Um, we would really love to see you there and meet you. Um, so definitely check that out. And um, finally, we'll just send an email afterwards with a replay link for the webinar so you can watch a recording. And then we're also going to send out the survey. So please do complete that. Um, and we really appreciate everyone for joining. Uh, thanks so much. It's been a, it's been a good talk. Thanks, Roland. Thanks, Piyush. You guys did a great job.